So happy International Women's Day, everybody. Uh, it's like good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and I think it's really good night to some people as we're joined by people from uh, nearly kind of all, all corners of the of the globe. Um, apologies for the for the day and getting going. We just wanted to wait for uh, kind of as many people as possible to join us, um, so that we're not we don't have too many people joining halfway through. Uh, so thank you for joining us for today's event to mark International Women's Day. Uh, the theme this year is Gender Equality Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow, recognizing the contribution of women and girls around the world who are leading the charge in all, on climate change adaptation, mitigation and response to build a more sustainable future for us all. So a couple of housekeeping rules just before we get into the main, uh, the main event. Um, so the webinar is being recorded and um, that's for the benefits of people who can't join us today. Uh, so we will be hearing from a panel of speakers, following which there will be a discussion with all panelists together and there'll be time for a QA and a um, at this. So if you have questions that come to you while the panelists are speaking during their presentations, please uh, put them in the chat box and we will use these to contribute to the, to the discussion at the end once all of the panelists have contributed their, their pieces. So uh, we are joined today uh, by four women who are taking action on our leading voices in the campaign to combat climate change. They're going to speak to us today about their own journeys and the challenges and the action that women can and are taking to tackle global warming. So our panel members are Sally Armitage, who's head of media and communications at the Global Evergreening Alliance, Priya Buller, who's co-founder of a startup in Sri Lanka that is growing bamboo to sequester carbon and combat climate change, Dr. Charmine Nilormi, who's Associate Professor at the Department of Economics in Jangar Nagar University and a leading expert in climate and gender justice in her native Bangladesh. And we have Dr. Fatima Denton, who is the Director of the United Nations University Institute for Natural Resources in Africa, uh, formerly Director of the Natural Resource Management Division and Coordinator of the African Policy uh, Climate Policy Centre. So in preparing for today's webinar, I was extremely lucky and that I got to have an over an hour conversation with each of our panelists with some really interesting and enlightening conversations. So a challenge for us today is going to be to condense this down into and get as much of this as we can into, into this, today's discussion. So just to I suppose, set the scene for, the, for today's discussion. So the latest IPCC report that was released last week was very alarming and shows that we are still far from reaching the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. It notes that there has been a substantial increase in extreme events and other climate change impacts across the globe in recent years. The report shows that up to 3.6 billion people and a high proportion of species are vulnerable to climate change. And further alarming news, a report released yesterday said that the Amazon rainforest is reaching a tipping point where large swathes will begin to transform into savanna. The authors of this paper also said that three quarters of the Amazon are showing dwindling resilience against droughts and other adverse weather events, meaning it's less able to recover. So what does this mean for all of us? So climate change is further exacerbating the global inequity and the spanning continents and generations. Women and girls are most directly experiencing the impact of the climate crisis, particularly in fragile and conflict affected states. Climate change is directly impacting the natural resources that women are responsible for in their communities. And when they're lost or damaged, women are at greater risk of poverty. Furthermore, women are systematically excluded from decision-making processes, despite the clear benefits to their inclusion and their knowledge of sustainable solutions that can work. Women are the engine of agriculture across Africa and Asia, working on small scale farms that support more than three quarters of the con two continents populations. They till the soil, plant the crops, weed the fields, harvest the produce, transport the goods and prepare the food. But although they carry up to, out up to 70% of the manual labor on small farms, they receive only a fraction of the available support. They're denied access to land, training, seed, knowledge and markets. And as a result, the yields for women farmers are substantially lower than for men by up to 20 to 30%. Uh, all activities undertaken by South South Africa and United Purpose promote discussion and mutual understanding of issues between women and men with regard to gender roles, unequal workloads and decision making to raise awareness and form programming and address gender inequality. Ultimately, across all of our work, we're seeking to increase women's voices in collective spaces, their decision making power and to increase their control over economic resources produced as a result of their labour. We're working towards ensuring that all of our programs are gender transformative and drive changing power dynamics within the households and communities that we work with. Uh, so I'll pass over now to our panel to get our conversation uh, going. So our first speaker today is Sally Armitage, 
So Sally is the head of media and communications at the Global Evergreening Alliance, which is a not-for-profit member-based platform that brings together capable research, technical and implementing organizations to address global challenges of food insecurity, rural poverty, climate change, and land degradation. In one of her previous careers, Sally worked in the emergency services uh, in Australia, dealing with both bushfires, I mean, right on the front line of climate related issues and also working in a male dominated environment. She also got to drive a fire truck, which I do have to admit to being very envious of, as that was my dream job when I was a little girl. Um, I also need to say it's after 11 p.m. in Melbourne where Sally is based, so a very warm welcome to you, Sally, and a big thank you for staying up so late to speak to us today and uh, welcome to the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Ola. Um, I actually have to admit that with driving the fire truck, it, it, that really came about because when I joined the, the local brigade, one of the lieutenants uh, happened to say that if he saw a, a woman driving his fire truck, he would blow them away with his shotgun. And I looked around and there was only one woman in the brigade, so I stormed off and got my heavy rigid licence. So. You know, I should probably be grateful for him to pushing me to, to do that. Um, now, is Jess going to be sharing slides for me this evening? I think she is. Ah, oh, super superb. Yes, yeah, so there's the, there's the first slide. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, and I'd really like to thank all of and all of our friends at Self Help Africa for inviting me to spend some time with you today. I'm humbled and touched because there's some amazing women on this webinar. Um, as Orla mentioned, I lead the mighty and big hearted media and communications team at the Global Evergreening Alliance. And I've been doing that for nearly three years now. It's a fantastic job. I love it. It's different every day. There's new challenges, more things to promote and things to talk about. Um, yes, I had a background in radio and then the emergency services, but in this space that I'm in now, I'm not a technical expert. Um, now it's not my job to race out and do fantastic stuff on the ground. It's my job to promote it, to talk about it, and also to raise the voices of women. And I'm going to share a couple of those examples with you today. Um, however, I may have included a little bit too much in this short 10 minute presentation. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a sprint if that's okay. So on the, the next slide, yes, this one, thank you. Um, I spoke to these people while I was having a think about what I should talk to you about today. And some of you may recognize them, even though this is definitely a, a photograph from the vaults. One is Tony Renodo, also known as the forest maker. And he's attributed with bringing about the resurgence of farmer managed natural regeneration back in the 80s. From his work, it then spread across more than 7 million hectares of land in Niger. Now, the government in Niger said it was closer to 10 million, but whichever it was, that's an absolutely huge number being attacked by a cat at the same time, apologies. But this land was restored for better agricultural production, meaning more food for communities, um, but also it got to the point where they were eventually able to sell their food to the World Food, food Programs, which is amazing. So Tony embarked on this mission to regreen the hearts and the minds of people across the world. He now works for World Vision Australia, where he's been for quite some time, and he's also one of our wonderful ambassadors. Now, on this next slide, because I'm mentioning farmer managed natural regeneration or FMNR, I thought just quickly in case there's a possibility that somebody in this webinar may not know what it is. It's the regrowing of trees and shrubs from stumps, roots, seeds of plants that are in the ground and are still alive and all they need is an opportunity to thrive which means protecting them, protecting them from cattle grazing on them, protecting them from your neighbor cutting them down, protecting them from yourself because it involves patience and basically pruning the smaller branches, which is being done in this photograph so that the stronger branches can grow. Now, it's easy, it's inexpensive, 
anyone can do it. And as Tony says, it's embarrassingly simple. Yet he won the Right Livelihood Award for it. And that's the environmental version of the Nobel Peace Prize. So on to the next slide. And we've, uh, we come back to him again. So why am I talking about Tony so much on International Women's Day? It's because he didn't go and do it on his own. He went with Liz, who's standing next to him in this photo. So when they hadn't been married for all that long at all, they did have a small baby though. Uh, they upped and moved to middle of nowhere in Niger. Um, both as missionaries, and they stayed for an unbelievable 15 years, not living somewhere fancy, living with the people, experiencing how they lived. Liz was on her own for long periods of time as well. She had another couple of babies while she was there. Um, and I can't even begin to imagine the kinds of things she had to get her head around as a young woman. So over the years, I've learned a lot from Tony, but I've also learned a lot from Liz. And she also just happens to be the office manager at the Secretariat of the Global Evergreen Alliance. So we see her on a daily basis and she's there to keep us honest about promoting the rights of women. We've spoken about her today on social media and I've also asked her if I can record one of our podcast episodes with her, uh, but she's avoiding me at the moment. I'm going to have to pursue her and get her to do it because it would be remarkable. So Liz understands all of their struggles with women. She also understands the importance of dignity because you can't have dignity when you're unable to provide food for your children, when you have to walk miles for firewood, when you don't have access to fresh water for cooking and cleaning and for sanitary reasons as well. And you can't do anything about this or reverse this situation or do anything to make it better unless you have a say and a voice. So really, this is what the Alliance was set up for, to answer these problems, to try and build on this work of FMNR, to scale it, to make it mainstream. And Liz has been involved in the Alliance in many different ways since the very beginning. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we're a member-based organisation. Um, these are most of our members. Um, I'm going to say most because you know what it's like when you start to list a whole lot of people you'd like to thank. There's always one person missing. But we work in a collaborative and inclusive way and some of these members were instrumental in setting up the Alliance in the first place. So in a nutshell, the Global Evergreening Alliance, it's an international NGO. It brings together leading research, technical, environmental and development organisations to build on the shared vision of restoring degraded lands. So rather than everyone competing for the same small grants to organise the same small projects, we accept that the answer has been found. We know what works and it's just a matter of scaling it. So the Alliance harnesses all of their members and partners' collective strengths, their capacities and their networks to coordinate, develop and implement massive scale land restoration programs. And I think that just quickly, it's important to highlight, especially today, that when these programs are designed with our members, we integrate the shared participation and decision making of women at every level. So, for example, at farmer field schools, 50% of participants must be women. In community level planning, again, 50% must be women. And when it comes to the distribution of revenue as far as possible, it needs to be run through community level mechanisms that are run by women again. Uh, so on the next slide, you will see a fantastic example of one of these large programs that we're talking about designed with our members. Restore Africa, designed with our members, and it will directly support at least 2 million farming households to restore more than 2 million hectares across East and Southern Africa. So Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zambia. Now, we were taking an announcement to COP26 about this program um, and about some investment into it. So if we go to the next slide, this is Irene Ojuk. Now, she's another one of our ambassadors and we are 
so fortunate to have her. She's not someone that we've met recently, which is the case with most of our ambassadors. Our relationship with Irene goes way back because she managed the Regreening Africa program in Kenya with World Vision, and we worked closely with her on that. And for those not in the know, um, Regreening Africa was the biggest ever grassroots led program in Africa to date. So she's now completing her PhD in Bonn, and guess what she's doing? It's on FMNR, and she's a huge champion for women's rights and for getting them a seat at the table when decisions are made that will directly affect them and their families and their communities. So as we were getting closer to COP26 last year, we knew that we were going to be announcing Climate Asset Management's commitment to invest in the Restore Africa program, and we had to decide who to send. So we settled on two women. The first one, uh, Karen Fawcett, she is a fearless powerhouse. She's from the corporate world. She's worked in banking. She sits on many boards. One of the boards she sits on is ours as well. And then the second woman that we chose was Irene. And the still that you can see here is of Irene on Sky News at the COP last year. We exhausted Irene. And it was even before she got to the COP. There were so many visa problems, we thought we weren't going to physically get her there. At one point, we had her flying in the polar opposite direction to the direction she most wanted to travel in. And she she even got to the stage where she was saying, you know, maybe I'm not important enough, nobody is going to help me get there. But that wasn't the case because after six days of trying, she eventually arrived because of the intervention from one of my favorite people in the world, Anthony Philipson, the British High Commissioner to Pretoria, who arranged for Irene to fly without a visa. And Irene and Anthony are still in touch today. I think that's a friendship that will last. But thank goodness, that she went because in this interview she was incredibly clear and passionate about the need to empower women and girls and to give them a stronger voice in the decisions that directly affect them and their families and their livelihoods too. So at COP26 she participated in radio interviews, she spoke at a GLF event for us, she helped to promote Tony's book, she networked, but it was at her last event, which was a closed room meeting that you can see on the next slide, that you know, really, really made the event unforgettable for her because she and Barack Obama were the only Africans in this small closed room gathering um, that we'd been invited to by our friends from Race to Resilience. And she said that he spoke to her in her native dialect. I, she was the perfect person to represent the voice of rural African women and children. And when she speaks, her words carry so much weight. I don't think that there could have been a better person to speak to such a significant announcement. And with that, I've probably hit at least 10 minutes. So I'm going to wish you all a very happy International Women's Day and hand you back to Orla. Many thanks, Sally, for um, great presentation. And um, well, the fact that there were only two Africans, as you say, in the room is quite uh, quite something. And that was something that came up in the conversations that I was having um, with some of our other panelists in preparation today, was the, kind of the different inequities that there are. I mean, today we're talking about International Women's Day, but the issue of, of, of race and representation is just kind of also very much at the heart um, of these conversations. Um, so no, thank you. Thank you very much for for that presentation and the, the work that the alliance is doing is is, is really fascinating um so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of activity um in the chat so just a reminder to people that if you have questions that are coming to you um if things are being sparked in your minds from the from some of the speakers to put them in the uh, in, in the chat or in the q a function um and we can we can get to we'll get to those uh at the end um so i'll hand over it now to um, Priya, who is our next uh, speaker today. Uh, so Priya is joining us from uh, sunny southwestern Sri Lanka. 
Um, Bria splits her time between uh, Sweden and Sri Lanka. She's a, a surfer extraordinaire, um, and more importantly, co-founder of Plan Boo, uh, who's working in nature-based uh, carbon dioxide removal. So Plan Boo uses bamboo to rapidly capture CO2, um, restore degraded land, and support livelihoods in, in the global south. Um, so Priya will tell us a lot more about this now. So welcome, Priya. Over to you. To share my screen. And you can let me know if you can see it okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I, I used to work at SHA between 2018 and 2020. Um, and so to see many familiar names there on Zoom and some new ones is, um, is lovely indeed. So uh, I started Plan Boo with two friends during COVID lockdown in 2020. And since then, as many startups do, it has evolved rapidly. And it's taken me from Sweden over last year to Sri Lanka, where I am today. So I'd like to talk to you a bit about the company and what we do and uh, the work we do to mitigate the impact of climate change. So you might know, and as Ola said, with the recent report with the IPCC, we now need to both rapidly reduce and remove greenhouse gas emissions. We now no longer have time to solely reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So it's widely understood now that we need to actually be reducing up to six gigatons, so six million tons per year to 2050 if we're to stay uh, on track to reach the Paris Accord. And that's about equivalent of the entire of the USA's annual emissions every year we need to be actually physically removing from the atmosphere. So we've got a big task ahead of us. So there are many solutions out there to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, we've got direct air capture plants, which are big, highly engineered factories, which are physically sucking CO2 from the atmosphere, right through to giant kelp, which is being thrown out into the sea, which is being filled with carbon and then sinking to the bottom of the ocean. At Plan Boo, we believe in harnessing the power of nature. So we work with bamboo, which is the fastest growing land plant in the world, which rapidly removes CO2. So why bamboo? Well, it's incredible. And as I said, it's, it's very fast growing and, and certain species, including the ones that we have here natively in, in Sri Lanka can grow up to one meter a day. So you could actually literally just watch it grow. Um, and, and bamboo is actually a grass. So many people think it's a tree, but it's a woody grass that can be harvested every year. So just in the way that you'd mow your lawn, it grows back again and regenerates and regenerates. So what we're left with is a huge sequestration of carbon, carbon potential, but also a large amount of physical harvested um, biomass. And bamboo is a pioneering species, which basically means it encourages ecosystems to flourish and can actually regenerate degraded soil. So there's lots of things you can do with bamboo. Some of you might have bamboo in your homes from chopping boards to furniture, right through to clothing. Um, but today I'd like to talk to you about what we're doing at the moment with bamboo, which is turning it into biochar. So biochar, you can see in the picture on the left, looks just like charcoal, but it's slightly different. Um, essentially we're using it, uh, bamboo biochar, as an organic soil fertilizer here in Sri Lanka. So we're partnering with the tea plantations, which have been heavily dependent on chemical fertilizers for 30 to 40 years. As a result, the soils have become pretty degraded. Um, and because the, the tea plantations, the, the tea industry is on the decline, as most people are drinking coffee now, they've been looking for ways that they can actually have an alternative to a chemical fertilizer that's very expensive. So we make this biochar through a process called pyrolysis. And essentially that means that we burn the bamboo at very high heat in as little oxygen as possible. And what that does is the, the liquids and the gases go off and we're left with a pure sponge-like charcoal shape. And this is incredible because what we can do is supercharge it. So we can put liquid organic composts um, that are made from jungle soil, fish guts, cow dung. We're experimenting with the different type of compost we can use and we can soak it into the biochar. So this biochar will then go into the soil as a soil amendment and slowly release the organic fertilizer into the soil. 
So it's a, it's a pretty important time for Sri Lanka. In April 2021, it's April last year, the government banned chemical fertilizers overnight. Uh, so this is with a, a view to moving the country entirely 100% organic. So having a, a nation that is 100% agriculturally organic, it's a fantastic idea, but without any transition period, it's just meant that the government, uh, that the country is experiencing a huge uh, food crisis. So more recently, the government have partially revoked this ban and said, okay, you can bring fertilizers in, but we'll take away the government subsidy for it. So understandably now there's only certain select uh, farmers within the agricultural sector that can actually get their hands on this fertilizer uh, and everyone else, including the smallholder farmers is, is suffering. So what we're hoping with our biochar, that it can be an alternative at a lower cost and organic, uh, replacing the need for MPK and other you know, fossil fuel derived chemical fertilizers. So this is how it works. So at the top, you can see we've got our bamboo and just like any other plant, it absorbs CO2 through photosynthesis and releases oxygen. And we're planting it in strategic locations within the tea plantations. So it can be planted on the perimeters that creates wildlife corridors for the elephants and the leopards to pass through and also planting it along the ravines, which actually helps the structure and the integrity of the soil, uh, which has been subject to, to flooding. And as, as we mentioned before, because we're harvesting the bamboo every year, we can create kind of a material bank of the sustainable material, uh, which can build a bamboo industry here in Sri Lanka that could be used for the construction industry, the fashion industry, and for, for anything else. So the kiln, the machine that I showed you, which was our basic prototype, is being fitted with a hood. And what this hood will do is capture the residual heat that is produced from cooking the biochar. And we're capturing this residual heat and we're able to channel it into the factories of the tea plantations, which can be used as secondary source of heating where they will dry the tea leaves. And what that does is stop the need for local deforestation for timber, which is currently how these furnaces within the factories are running. And as I mentioned before, the biochar itself is replacing the need for chemical fertilizers, which is a cost saving for the uh, tea plantation and also a lot better for, for the environment. And so the cycle continues. So it's this process itself that actually triggers the generation of a carbon removal credit. So a carbon credit essentially represents one ton of CO2 equivalent. So that can be carbon dioxide, but it could also be any other greenhouse gas emission. And I know that SHA themselves and United Purpose have been exploring the, the carbon market, but now is a really critical time. People are waking up to the need to do something about climate change. And so more and more businesses, it's being really driven by large corporates like Microsoft, Klarna and Stripe. They've set strong targets, big pledges to reach net zero by 2040, 2050. And now they know that they can not only reduce, but they're gonna to have to remove the remaining of their emissions. So what Plan Boo does is generate those carbon credits through these local partnerships in Sri Lanka and sell them, sells them to businesses on the voluntary carbon market. So it's a very exciting time to be in the, in the voluntary carbon market, to be honest. Um, it's it's uh, in Sweden in, in particular, it's kind of the hub of sustainability and the hub of the startup space. So I have the privilege to be able to call both locations my home right now. And we have Sweden that ranks first in the EU on the gender equality index and fifth in the entire world. And then we've got Sri Lanka that's ranking 75th the gender inequality index. But with regards to Sweden, despite being one of the most gender equal countries in the world, the tech startup and climate impact space that I am in is still disproportionately outweighed for men towards women. And in fact, there's only 5%, I believe, of the female population that are working within the startup space. And 82% of venture capitalist funding went to all male teams with the remaining being spread between mixed teams and I think two or 3% that went to female only teams. And so then when you look and you dive a bit deeper and you look into those funding systems themselves, the majority of the larger rounds is going to men and women are actually securing uh, rounds of, of less money during their um, equity raising. So what I'm trying to say is that even within the most equal countries, there's still a lot of work to do. So what can we do? 
Well, at Plan Boo, we've started internally. I'm extremely grateful to be running Plan Boo with two co-founders and friends. That's Freddie on the left and Mark on the right. And they are examples of gender champions. They have made me feel consistently heard and respected, and they've encouraged my ideas for ways that we can make Plan Boo gender equal both internally and externally within the organization. So they've allowed me to lead the charge on ensuring that voices of women and especially voices of women of color here in Sri Lanka are heard at all levels. So that's from the planning stages to the business negotiations and right through to building the tech. They stand up for me and they stand up for other women when things don't feel right. And they're open to listening and learning from women's experiences. So I'm really proud to be to have them as co-founders. Secondly, mentoring other women. We have recently partnered with some universities out here. And this is from a, a recent event that we did at the University of Rahuna. So we're taking on a number of students from the BSc level and the master's level, and they will be looking at the efficacy of our biochar within the yields of the tea plantations here in Sri Lanka. And so we will be supporting all women during that time, and I'll personally be mentoring them throughout the entire of 2022. Thirdly, and last but not least, showing up. Just by being in the room as a woman, your presence is powerful. And that's what I'm coming to learn here. Change might not come overnight, but there is a change happening throughout the world. So just by being present, we're already taking a stand. So I'm gonna leave it there and uh, looking forward to welcoming any questions later on. Thanks, Willa. Yeah, many thanks, Priya. That's a really interesting uh, presentation there. And there are a couple of technical questions coming up and um, we might save that for uh, for the end, if that's okay to our to our audience. Um, I might just ask uh, one quick question, it's rather a big question, um, or maybe not as that you were talking about the, the low representation, even in Sweden, of, of women within the tech startup sector, and we will always hold Sweden kind of up on a bit of a pedestal, that what advice would you give to, to women and, and girls who are looking to do more and engage um, within the climate and the startup space? I would say just start. There's so many reasons not to, and especially in the climate space where it feels very overwhelming at times. Uh, a lot of people feel disconnected from even attempting to tackle the climate crisis because the problem seems so big. So first and foremost, it's, it's just to start. And while throughout the world, women are being held back, there's also ways that we can get out of our own way. Um, I know I spent a, a lot of time throughout my twenties holding myself back telling myself that I didn't deserve to be in the room, struggling with imposter syndrome. And so that's up to each of us as individuals to get out of our own way and then be part of the change that is coming. Um, and then just start really, keep ourselves accountable to listen and to learn. Um, and then source a mentor. I've had the support of incredible women along the way that have encouraged me to kind of grow into my own skin um, and, and start mentoring others as well. So whether you're in the mentor role or the mentee position, I think there's so much to learn from, from keeping other women close and, and all moving forward together. Great. Thanks, Pri. I'm sure you're an, an inspiration to many of the, of the, the young women you're working with in, in Sri Lanka. Um, we'll pass now over to uh, Dr. Sharmin Nilormi. So Dr. Nilormi is one of the best known Bangladeshi experts working on gender justice and climate change. She has taught economics at, and apologies for my pronunciation, we put a little lesson on it yesterday by throwing it to get it wrong again, at Jahangir Nagar University in Bangladesh, um, focusing on environmental economics, climate change, vulnerability, disaster risk reduction and gender. Uh, Dr. Nalormi has contributed to the IPCC's fifth assessment report and has advised the Bangladeshi Ministry of Environment and Forest and the Department of Women's Affairs in formulating policies on gender issues related to climate change impact in Bangladesh. Uh, you're very welcome uh, this afternoon uh, for you, uh, Charmin. So uh, I'll pass over to you now. Thank you, Ola, and thanks the organizers for inviting me. Uh, often, uh, as I'm trained in um, economics, as an economist, I'm asked why uh, we need to adverse climate change and why I am practicing climate change and environmental issues. Even my students, my uh, senior academic uh, uh, in the economics discipline, that question is uh, quite common. 
so there is a graph. Uh, may I uh, request for the next? Uh, yeah, thank you. So there is a graph. Uh, it says that uh, whenever Bangladesh has a extreme weather event, then our agricultural GDP fell and our national GDP has a huge impact because of uh, uh, these climatic uh, hazards and all that. We are a living Delta and centuries and millennia, uh, uh, we have been facing climatic hazards and uh, extreme weather events. But since last 50 years, the frequency and intensity has been changing and climate variability, if not change, is very evident. And uh, this graph actually tells us why we need to mainstream climate change issues in our economic prioritization. For example, if I make a road, then we need to uh, level up that road, keeping in mind the flood level that is expected in terms of increased rainfall and increased uh, glacial melt in this region. And uh, when we, whenever we make embankments, those embankments, the designing of that embankments, of course, needs climate change data and issues to be a, a built in. The next uh, slide, please. And uh, then the question comes, uh, why uh, addressing gender issues uh, in a developing countries is so important because uh, as a LDC or, or a uh, aspiring middle income country, we have lot priorities, lot more priorities in terms of development agenda uh, to do uh, in our development strides. Uh, so why addressing climate change? I answered that question. Now, why gender? So uh, there are uh, three dimensions on it. One is to understand women's sphere in a climate hotspot. Because sex and gender-based differential vulnerability are there, so everybody is vulnerable but there are differential vulnerability and such documentation in each climate hotspot is critically important. And the state of empowerment of women and men at that hotspots is also need to be understood. Accordingly, responding to gender aware, equality and sensitive criteria in planning and actions are important and uh, not even in Bangladesh, but in most of the countries at policy and an action level, there is a void in understanding. I can cite one example and I'm um, showing you the picture. This is the globally acclaimed cyclone shelter after the devastating cyclone in 1991 where we lo lost about 0.3 million people, the shelters were built. You know, our priorities were to save lives from uh, cyclones at the coast. So uh, in 90s, after 1991, we built shelters, sophisticated cyclone warning system and effective dissemination were at place. Still, there were reluctance to go to shelters after receiving cyclone warning, and we observed it, we experienced it in 2007, in 2008, there were two climatic episodes, cyclonic episodes in coastal belts. So we inquired and saw that the gender uh, so design criteria of that cyclone shelter is very gender insensitive. What we saw, the 
you know, ground floor, it's completely uh, submerged with the cyclonic water surge. So people get sheltered on the first floor and there is no toilet on the first floor. The only toilet in the cyclone shelter are on the ground floor. The white one on the ground floor at the field, you can see. So we asked the women, women in 2007 and eight who didn't go to shelters after receiving the warning, why didn't you go? So they said, we were not, we were not sure whether we will be staying there for three hours or three days. So having toilet and keeping privacy is a priority for women. And then after that research and lots of advocacy, now uh, uh, Bangladesh government actually uh, uh, amended those design and the new uh, cyclone shelters are built in more gender sensitive way, the designing are, are much better right now. Uh, next slide, please, please. And not only Bangladesh, I told you about the global level. So if you, uh, you know, Google uh, in the IFRC website, so there are seven thematic areas that bips up. Every second it bips up. And these are the seven, uh, um, uh, thematic areas they work on. And uh, these pictures uh, that it bips up, you know, every second. And you see there is no woman. And I'm talking about IFRC. And, and that's, that's the very mind says, isn't, uh, you know, definitely IFRC had very credible uh, interventions in terms of, uh, you know, serving women, serving adolescent girls, serving ethnic minorities, serving disabled people. But still, if you check on their profiles, uh, uh, you can see these pictures. So sometimes, not sometimes, in many times, we actually miss uh, that uh, women have different priorities and, and, and uh, they are completely missed out. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what I say, when we say that climate change in an LDC, for example, like Bangladesh, Bangladesh is a small delta, but it has, due to its diverse hydrogeophysical realities, it has different climatic hazards at, at different uh, uh, geophysical uh, locations. And it's a lower riparian country. So water sharing, water availability, temperature, rainfall is very much important. Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna Basin, we are caught up with this GBM basin and water is very important for that. So what we plan for Kurikram or, or in the North Western part, we cannot plan it for Northeastern part. And the coastal belt, even three of the coastal belts completely deserves three different kinds of att uh, attention and adaptation plan. So the message is even in a, a single country, even in a climate hotspot, there might be seasonal drought, there might be seasonal rainfall. So we need to be very careful when we plan around. Next slide. Sorry, next slide. Yeah. Vulnerability is always context specific. So I told you about geophysical context and upon that, when social norm, due to social norms and responsibility, we add social context, under climate change, the overall vulnerability is likely to be increased, but women try to cope with the altered hydrogeophysical condition the most. And there are differential vulnerability. So women's priority, the a hard thought process is not hard off. 
in policies, in our national water management policy, salinity in water came up as a major issue, but that water is for agricultural use, not for drinking. But for women, as she is the responsible person in the uh, uh, family to take care for uh, water availability and all that, uh, our national uh, management uh, or national water management plan doesn't give that much focus on salinity in drinking water. Next slide, uh, please. Yeah. So uh, we all know adaptation and mitigation other than uh, financing, technology transfer and other thematic areas. These are the two major issues. Uh, uh, key components we all often talk about. And for LDCs like ours, even the aspiring middle-income country, adaptation uh, is very important. And adaptation is not coping. Adaptation is always doing better, defying the adversities of climate change. For example, in a saline tone area, the saline tolerant crop varieties are practiced by farmers and the productivity is much more better than they used to do with the other varieties earlier. So this is called adaptation that we are doing now better, but this involves much more technical knowledge, much more investment on technology, the dissemination of the technology, skill development of the client, the recipients, and other hardware and software infrastructure, basically huge investment. And uh, the solutions cannot be sorted in silo. So land rights, access to financial institutions, linkages to market, mobility, security, skill enhancement, and, and so forth. All these issues actually encompass. May I ask for the next slide? So just one or two examples where we stand. In Bangladesh, feminization of agriculture is happening. Women's increased participation in the agriculture sector is very much noticeable. Only 4.6% women are agricultural holders. More than 80% are unpaid female employment in Bangladesh, mostly in agriculture sector. And our specialized agriculture bank for last 50 years after our independence, they only provided 8% uh, you know, of the recipients are women by those banks. So we actually can see even the increased participation after the increased participation of women, the extension services, the financial institutions, the land rise, those are not go going to women. And we expect women to be as efficient as male. So it's not, uh, you know, a justice uh, uh, altogether. So may I request for uh, next slides? Yeah. Now, uh, women are not homogeneous. There are different issues within a climate hotspot among different sex and classes of women, especially the disabled women, the ethnic minority, and the poor women, those are the most vulnerable and lactating mother, pregnant women, those are the most vulnerable sex of the communities under climate change. And interestingly, there are not so divide. When we you know, go to even FCCC processes, we see uh, women from North and women from South, uh, they talk on different issues, their priorities are different, even their prior perceptions and uh, points uh, on, on, on the same issues uh, may get uh, 
you know, different modalities may get di different uh, uh, perceptions. Climate change is clearly is a development issue. So may I request uh, uh, the next slide? Yeah. Mitigation is not a priority for Bangladesh and other LDCs because there is already an adaptation gap. But in INDCs, our nationally determined contribution that we submitted to UNFCCC and all other LDCs and middle income countries, we said that we will try to low carbon intensive uh, country and take that L LCD pathway. But due to non-action at global level, the adaptation gap is widening. And uh, I will uh, cite you one example. At the plenary session of one even a triple C COP, uh, the younger representative asked the global arena that let us uh, put something for the global vulnerable women and save one penny. They call for to save uh, every person at the uh, north to save one penny and give it, make a fund and give it to South so that the vulnerable women of the South can be helped. But for a South, a representative from the South, we don't need that money actually. If the lifestyle from the North is changed, then we can sort it out. Our adaptation plan is set. We know how to survive. We call for a accelerated action to mitigate and greenhouse gas emission reduction. The last one, please. Yeah. So after all these, women keep smiling and that's the strength of women uh, we all see around us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charmaine. That was a really, really interesting presentation. I think some really kind of key points uh, coming out of that. And I like those of the, we're talking about women are not a one homogenous group. <laughs> we make up, there are billions of us in the world and we can't, there are different solutions, as you say, for, for the different challenges that are facing people um, in different contexts. And also could really liked the point around, you don't need the money from the global North if people change their lives and- um, Of not course. Vote. It kind of calls a slight crossover the conversation I had with uh, Dr. Fatima Denton yesterday, and it was like we there's a need for people to change their lifestyles and to change it to a point where it might hurt, but that's the benefit is going to be accruing to 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 everybody, and um and and that's a, that's that's what, what it's all about. Um, in a part of our conversation yesterday, you were talking about we were talking about climate finance and yeah. the, the, the different types of climate finance and, and who should really be a, kind of benefiting from it or how it should be targeted. Um, and you were, we were talking about forced migration and, yeah. and financing around that. Could you talk maybe just a little bit to that point? Yeah. Uh, so migration is very evident at local level, but when we, in terms of climate change, in the climate change discipline, we talk about migration. That is not opportunistic migration. That is always forced migration. So because of failed livelihoods, because of, uh, you know, uh, the impossibility of an environment to live in, people migrate. There are permanent migration and there are seasonal migration. So from Bangladesh and LDC, what we, LDC group, we have been uh, soliciting and, and uh, uh, advocating for the global uh, north that, uh, some of the countries in the global north have their very clear preference to attract immigrants from countries like ours. Uh, they, you know, there is a pull factor, not, sure, not only the push factor, there's a pull factor. Our trained agriculture scientists, our skilled uh, people, they are migrating. Yeah. So mm -hmm. 
what we suggest that there are climate migrants, uh, the global north, they can fund us, we can uh, make these people, climate vulnerable people uh, trained so that uh, if they go to those countries, they can get used to and, and, and they can get adjusted to that society. Mm -hmm. So there should be a window of facilitated migration for climate victims in LDCs at the global level. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine. Um, just a reminder to people to keep your questions. There are some that are in the in, in the chat and the Q&A, which we're keeping track of them. So we'll we'll get to those at the end. But just a reminder to people. Um, we're not we're not going to have the facility for people to be to be able to speak because um, there, there are too many people involved. So if you do have something, please, please put it in the in the chat. Um, so uh, say thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, so just moving to our final speaker of the day of today, the esteemed Dr. Fatima Denton. So Fatima is the director of the United Nations University for Natural Resources in Africa, um, based in Ghana. She's an accomplished uh, senior leader in the UN system with in-depth expertise in natural resource management, as well as a deep knowledge of research and policy development and the African region. Um, Dr. Denton is a lead author for the IPCC Special Report on Climate Change and Land, and a lead author for the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report um, from Working Group 3. It was also a lead author for the Fourth and Fifth Assessment Reports. Um, and for the IPCC special report on renewable energy and climate change mitigation. I could continue on, but I fear we'd, we might run out of time if, if, if I was to go through all of the, the various working groups. Um, so Fatima, I'm going to welcome to the, the conversation uh, today and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. So happy International Women's Day to you, Ola, and to um, my fellow panelists and um, to our um, um, audience as well. I, I thought perhaps the most useful contribution I can make is to just talk about my observations. Um, I think today is a day of reflection um, and especially to see how far we've come in um, recognizing women um, and gender issues in this um, very complex um, debate um, on climate change. So I thought perhaps it, it would be better to maybe speak in three categories. Um, firstly, to talk about what makes me hopeful, um, to talk about what makes me, I mean, the reasons for concern, what keeps me worried, I think, why, why I'm, I'm still somewhat worried about certain trends. And perhaps to talk also about um, opportunities um, that we need to really begin to harvest. So let me start with the first um, observation, the first set of observations about what makes me hopeful. I think it's, um, it, it's, it, it is a reality today to really assert the fact that um, since um, I would say the Beijing Declaration, we have come a long way um, 25 years later. Um, when we had the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, this whole intersectionality discussion was a non-issue. Um, climate change and gender were simply not um, on that radar. Um, and today, 25 years later, we are very much talking about the intersectionality of climate change um, and gender. Um, I think it's also fair to say that we are now thinking a lot more holistically. We, we're not sort of um, just... Um, talking about gender issues separately from these um, from climate change, but we are really talking about issues around climate justice, um, how we make um, good on climate action and how we do that uh, with women as um, important um, contributors and agents um, to that conversation. 
Um, that said, I think um, there are still uh, a few things that we are still, or at least I'm still worried about. Um, when, when I started talking about climate change and gender in the early 2000s, um, some of my colleagues at the time, I think, felt that we were probably stretching the issue a bit too much, that we were overanalyzing it. Um, so we were guilty of that, or at least they made us feel like we, we should be guilty of looking beyond the human dimension and the human security dimension, because as far as they could see, you know, there was no such distinction about women or men, um, or even looking at it from a gender perspective. This was just a human security dimension, and that's where, um, that's how far we should go. Um, so it was a struggle, it was a push um, to really look at it from the sectors uh, that are affected where we felt that uh, women had quite a lot of contribution to make, um, where they were facing quite a lot of losses um, and where you know, the um, knowledge asymmetry was also um, affecting their ability to be fully part of that discussion. And so we're looking at issues around energy poverty. We're looking at issues around agricultural production, uh, what that meant, um, especially against the background of, um, you know, not having the right tools, um, as you said in your excellent um, framing, um, Ola. Um, there is a there is a chronic um, a chronic problem of um, capacity. There is a chronic problem of resources, and there is a chronic problem of knowledge. Um, so we, 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 we basically had to bring all of that, um, all of those issues um, to the fore. Um, but today, I think for me, what I see is that, yes, the road um, progress has been made, but the road is still bumpy. Um, I think that when we look at some of the issues, we are recalibrating the, dis the discussion, um, even in terms of the language. We're talking about climate emergency. We're talking about urgency. But in that recalibration of the discussion, we're not giving gender the equal urgency that it deserves. Uh, we're not putting gender, you know, at the, the foremost, I would say, part of our radar um, in terms of, you know, um, some of these issues and not have been there for too long. And, um, you know, women's, women's rights um, and their sense of empowerment has been, has been jeopardized. Um, as well as their income um, and livelihood strategies. So that for me is, is still, a, it's still a concern. We've moved the debate where we're really talking about the importance of not just talking about climate change as it is, but really um, escalating the discussion to um, a, a point of emergency. Uh, but that somehow doesn't mirror um, the stark inequities that are there. Um, and that women have to face on a daily basis. So that's, that's a worry. The second point I think which is a worry for me is, in as much as we talk about locking ourselves in, in terms of emissions, we are locking women in. Um, we're locking them in because when we talk about potential opportunities for green business and green entrepreneurship, we're not somehow factoring women into that agenda. When we talk about the expansion of renewable energy or even with green hydrogen and the possibilities and market prospects that that come with, somehow women are peripheralized, uh, peripheralized still. They're not seen in that greater um, discussion. So I think that there's still that, those sort of power asymmetries. Um, there is the sense that we still haven't really factored women as you know, agents of change and um, um, groups that should be included um, in these market prospects. Um, we're still doing a double take, I would say. We still have a tendency on the big issues where we're talking about issues around climate change and urbanization. We somehow go into big narratives, we rehearse them, and then we come back and do the and issue, you know climate change and urbanization, climate change and gender, you know, so I, I still feel somehow that we are, we are um, sort of analyzing the issues in a tiered manner. We don't start with gender as a, as a main problem or main issue. We, we, we come back at it 
um, and we, we're losing time. Um, so there is that sort of procrastination loss um, in the fact that we are not really um, coming at it um, full on, but you know, coming at it in a, in a more tangential manner. Um, the other thing that worries me slightly, and to some extent, I think we should do that, but I sometimes worry about representation. Because I think when we represent, even with the best intention, you know, there is a sense that we're not representing fully enough um, some of the voices that we need to, um, that need to emerge in that representation are not fully heard. Uh, there is a tendency to infantilize women still, uh, where we basically say this is what they need and see them from that victim's perspective rather than recognize um, the full scale of their contribution. Um, so I think that victimhood is still not far from our analysis, you know, and, and, and some of us are guilty of it uh, more so than others, but there's still a sense that we have to do less of that. Um, and in that representation, as, as well intentioned as that is, we need to really allow for space uh, we, where women who are in the front line can tell their own stories fully. Um, some of the things that I think that we are also um, not taking fully into account is in as much as we talk about urgency of climate change, um, we are not taking into account the um, cost of omission. Um, the cost of omission when we leave equity out of the conversation, the cost of omission when we do not recognize uh, the full contribution of women in the agricultural sector, in aquaculture, in climate smart agriculture, in so many of the productive sectors uh, where we, we, we know that we, when we do climate action properly, that these would be impactful sectors. So I think that uh, we need to find ways of, you know, what, it, what does it cost? Uh, there's an economic cost, you know, there is a health cost, there is a societal cost. What does it actually cost when um, the full weight of women's contribution are discounted? Um, and that is, I think, is important. And lastly, I would say um, the things that I feel we should um, see as potential opportunities in this discussion. We're talking about building back better, recalibrating our economies, reshaping lives. Um, in that reshaping of life, we shouldn't leave, we shouldn't lock women into this microness. Um, open up the spaces for women to fully be, um, 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 as I'd say, empowered agents, but also allow women the space to, to learn, to grow, to flourish, um, rather than just have it all out, you know, um, all um, figured out for them. Um, and, and the whole aspect of retooling, as we talk about build up, build back better, what does it mean for, as we talk about the need to restructure our, our economies, that restructuring also happens, needs to happen at the societal level. Um, and gender restructuring is important. You know, you were talking about land and, and what that means, the implications of not even having land, you know, or not having good land. You know, what, what does it mean if we are going to move towards a green transition? So these are some of the things that I feel we should, we should, we should um, not um, delegate to others, but we should allow women to be at the forefront. Um, green industrialization, there, there is a sense that we now need to move towards that. We're talking about industrialization in Africa as something that is very important, but we don't want to industrialize in the same way that Western societies have done. Uh, we want to industrialize in a way that we don't have to come back and clean up later. So how do we do that and how do we do it in ways that women can be part of that strategy and can be part of that plan. Um, clean cooking, um, you know, often these are solutions that are almost pre-thought and, 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 and designed um, in advance. You know, how do we take women along the design um, stages so that they are also part of um, the solutions as well? And then lastly, I would say, Adaptation is very, very important, but there are opportunities in mitigation as well. Uh, what are those opportunities? How do we begin to harvest some of those opportunities in forestry? Uh, in some of the very sort of low, I mean, um, high, high intensive industries, um, how do we ensure that women also have a mitigation knowledge? 
So these are some of the things that um, I thought I should just um, bring to the table. Um, I, I said lastly, but I just remembered that there's the, the whole discussion around indigenous knowledge. You know, we, we're losing some of that and women have got long years of indigenous knowledge. And how do we allow that indigenous knowledge, not necessarily to compete with scientific knowledge, but to complement some of the uh, scientific knowledge as well. So with that, I'll, I'll, end, uh, I'll end here and I'm open for further discussions and questions. Great, M many thanks, Fatima. That was that was really interesting and, and kind of a lot to kind of to, to digest um, uh, in that. Um, I'm just kind of keeping and keeping an eye on on the on the time and the Q and A um, the, the Q and A session. Um, so I'll just I'll, uh, maybe start opening up some of the, some of the questions. But as I, I, it's I think the, the challenges as you say there there are still many, but I think it is also important as you've said to acknowledge kind of the that there is a reason to be hopeful that we have come a long way. Um, so things that we're talking about now weren't even on the agenda um, a, a number of years ago. Um, so I think, I think Priya alluded to it as well, that sometimes people think that the issues are so big, they don't even know where to start. So that recognition that we've there is progress being made um, is, is, is a reason to, to, to give us hope. Um, so it's tying into you know, a lot of the, the points you've been making about the need for the, the uh, the, the allowing space for women and giving them their their, their greater voice um, some of the questions coming in um, from the from the audience have been around well, how, how do we do that how do we give women that that space um, how do we how do we increase their voice and just kind of getting them involved uh, particularly very vulnerable women um, or uh, people who might be um, suffer have be living with a disability uh, widows uh, pregnant young on, on low levels of education so From your experiences, what are the ways that we would bring people into women into the debate? Right. Um, well, I think, as you said, there are there are um, sometimes problems in terms of bringing them fully into the debate, and so we have to do it in stages. So I wasn't in any way discounting that. Um, but I think when I, I mean, let me take one concrete example. We talk a lot about the importance of knowledge, um, especially knowledge for adaptation. And, and women, you know, smallholder farmers need knowledge. They need to know exactly what to do, you know, in case of floods, they need to know what to do. And, you know, they have a poor season, they need to know what to do when um, the rains are not coming. So, so that sort of forecasting knowledge, um, I think we have to find ways of um, bringing women into that conversation so that they understand the implications of um, how these um, events, extreme events, could um, really, you know, ruin their harvest or their prospects for livelihoods. So, so I think the traditional way of doing that still stands. We, we, we can't change that. It's in focus group discussions. It's greater sensitize, sensitization. It's greater levels of awareness, etc. But my problem is that we, we can't keep them at that stage forever. <laughs> uh, what I sometimes see as a problem is that we, we, we haven't gone far enough, uh, far enough in our analysis of the issues, far enough in the um, involvement of how women can be brought into these arenas and into these conversations. So I, I would say that we need to look at it as a, as a tiered approach. It's a gradualist approach, but there are ways where we can start empowering women. So women that have already got a greater sense of what needs to be done could be trainers, they could be empowering others, you know, um, they could be invited to conferences, we could expand their horizons. I mean, there's so many different ways and, and some, some of us are doing that. Some organizations are doing that. I'm sure many of the panelists that we've had today are already doing some of that, but we just need, a, we need it at a scale that it would become transformational. We don't need it as, you know, the, the potential anecdotal story here and there. Um, I think it's a scale issue right now. Um, and that's, that's, that's what we need to work towards. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Fatima. Um, uh, I will, oh, thank you. Thank you, technical team for opening. I was going to say we spotlight some of the other panelists as well, so we can open up the, the discussion for kind of contributions from, um, from all of the panelists. Um, so, 
a question and from Aaron Towers kind of linked to this point. So like, are there examples of women um, breaking into male dominated environments where they're creating structures, policies and ways of working that are new and, and different? So I'm, I'm hoping I can uh, be heard. So there's, there's been a power cut and, a, and currently in a heavy storm, but hopefully you'll be able to hear me all right. Um, so in Sweden, where, where we're based for half of the year, there is a drive to create forums for women, you know, entrepreneurs to come together uh, to learn from one another. And now there's examples of startup accelerator programs and VC firms that will only accept companies that have mixed teams or women only teams. So they are still few and far between, between but there's definitely a move towards that. The accelerator that I moved to Sweden for um, would only accepted us as, as a team working in the climate impact space um, on the grounds that we were a mixed team. And so the kind of changes like that coming through, unfortunately you can sometimes become tokenized. Um, but my understanding is that we have to start somewhere and by being one of those women who starts to show her face in the, te in the cl uh, climate impact space, that will inspire more women to, to see that, you know, that they can come forward and do the same. So yeah, the change doesn't happen overnight, but um, I think policies like that, and that can be led by the private sector as well, do, do have an impact. Sure. Thanks. Thank you, Priya. Um, Sally, I might put a question to you, um, if that's okay. So kind of linking into so the Global Evergreening Alliance, a lot of the investment the funding would come from private sector companies who are obviously very interested in offsetting um, their, their, their emissions. Is there much of a focus on, on, on the benefits occurring to women within their thinking, or is, is that going to another piece of education that we need to be doing with the investors and funders who are looking at, um, at, at investing for substantial amounts of money within uh, climate uh, carbon offsetting programs? Um, yes, I can speak to I can speak to one investor to give an example. Um, the investor that we went to COP26 with climate asset management, um, there's one particular woman who works for that organisation, uh, Caroline Van Tilborg. She is somebody to watch. I think she's probably ex, I'm going to say common land. I can't remember off the top of my head, but she has constantly pushed to make sure that there's going to be great benefits for people on the ground and that women will benefit from this as well. And only the other day she was saying that um, as part of their investment, they would like to see communities, you know, traveling and sharing experience between each other. So uh, she's a she's a very positive example of an organization that we work with. And I think that if more start to think like that, it's really going to take away a lot of this this feeling that people have with, you know, investors into carbon programs, bad, because they're not all like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sally. I wasn't just at the, maybe as a, a follow on question, um, the carbon offsetting bad, <laughs> how do you deal with some of the critiques that are around that it's, it's, it's greenwashing? Um, and I'm, I'm getting the exciting questions. Um, I would I would have to say that the way the way we deal with it is if we're going to be dealing with an investor, then the first thing that we do is we organize um, a due diligence on them. And that looks uh, not just at whether or not they seem appropriate right now, but what they have planned for the future and how aggressive their their policies and strategies are to reduce their emissions um, because we feel that um, the only area that they should be spending money to offset their emissions on should be where they can't stop doing this polluting work or where it's going to take them a long time to do it. Mm -hmm. So we do the whole due diligence process, but that's not where it stops. Uh, the next step is harder because, as I said, we're a member-based organisation. So this, uh, these findings then go to the Strategic Advisory Council and that is, you know, our members sit on that. 
and you'd have seen from some of the logos, there's a lot of logos there from organisations that have an awful lot to say about extractives and organisations that they feel are not doing the right thing, particularly the environmental organisations. So for us, no funding agreements assigned unless it gets through this process and it goes in front of all of our members. Great. That's the best way we can avoid it. Thank you, Thank you Sally. Um, Fatima, there's a question uh, here for you in the in in the chat. So it's saying that in in Africa, women are at the, are at the heart of urban economies um, across all countries, but cities still keep women at the periphery in terms of policies and programs. Even though women are the majority of urban farmers and uh, MSE owner operators, um, areas which are affected by by climate. So how can we fast track their voice in the power circles? Yeah. So I think I think we need to get a, a, a greater sort of um, recognition of the sectors, the cut, the more, the higher sort of intensive sectors, especially that are city related. Transport is one of those. Uh, manufacturing is one of those. Um, and then to be able to really understand what is the role that women are already playing in those sectors and how we can raise their voices, um, um, especially. So um, there is a lot that's been done on urban agriculture, for instance, and I think that there, there, there is more that needs to be done to encourage women. Um, there is um, also the whole aspect of, um, um, I'll say, especially in the area of extractives, um, the, the whole aspect of artisanal small scale mining um, is often done at the expense of women, um, at the expense of their health, um, at the expense of their security. Um, so I think there should be a consciousness there um, for governments to, you know, factor gender issues into these, um, into the solutions. Um, I don't know how much we are doing also related to nationally determined contributions and the space that is made um, for women. Um, in, in understanding where the vulnerabilities are, but also in looking for uh, real solutions. So, so I'd say there's still quite a lot to do in terms of cities, from urban health, manufacturing. Um, I, I mentioned the whole aspect of green industrialization from um, more of the traditional sectors um, that are still that are still important in Africa. In Africa, all the traditional sectors like transport, um, I'd say, are, are really important, but we don't often see women in those sort of roles. Um, we, we have a tendency to prioritize um, action, but we don't necessarily see women as key agents in that sector. So I'd say we, we need to do a little bit more. We need to um, recognize the vulnerabilities that are inherent in those sectors mm -hmm. um, and find ways of bringing women um, more on board um, in, 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 in everything related to clean cooking, to uh, better opportunities in the manufacturing sector, to um, expanding the um, opportunities for green businesses um, and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, raising more awareness in terms of urban health issues, um, air pollution, uh, what, what happens when, you know, women are constantly exposed to those things. And these this, uh, sometimes are not climate related. So not everything should be conflated to climate. Um, some of these are issues that have been there, structural problems, um, long time. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to find ways of, you know, the, the climate drivers and the non-climate drivers, but also identifying where we think um, women should have a key role to play and how we sensitize, um, sen sensitize them um, more so. Great, thank you. Um, and I maybe just one final question to um, Charmaine and 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 you, Fatima, and obviously um, Sally and, and Priya, um, feel free to join in. But you're you've both participated in IPCC um, uh, at different at different points on the on the reports and so on. How do you feel the role of women is within the IPCC itself? Is it is it is it equitable? Is there is there are there enough female voices within the IPCC and the and the different structures that you've been that you work with alongside that? Yeah. So uh, we need to understand that IPCC doesn't create any science. Uh, it uh, uh, builds upon the 
peer reviewed publications. So whatever the knowledge we gathered, IPCC consistently uh, build on uh, uh, in, inside those references and build up uh, policies, issues, and new knowledge. So uh, if uh, uh, the gender related issues uh, are not that much focused and not in much in, a, in publications, so to say peer reviewed publications in journals, so uh, we, we can't actually refer uh, in, in, in a major way uh, in terms of uh, gender and all that. And Fatima is very right in saying that, the for example, the climate modeling, the GIS issues, uh, having climate hotspots, we don't, we, we, we actually uh, never tried how gender issues can be incorporated in the, not only gender issues, but other social issues as well, in climate modeling, in uh, GIS modeling, and in other, uh, uh, other uh, academic uh, uh, and science-related discussions. So it's difficult for IPCC process uh, uh, to really do justice on gender, and in terms of participation, I'm sure. Uh, so there is, uh, you know, Fatima, and 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 you can uh, count on fingers uh, the participation of women in the process. Yeah, maybe if I could just add quickly that um, I think your your most powerful arsenal is knowledge in the IPCC process. So that's the thing you can rely on. Um, and it, it's an open um, sort of um, engagement, you know, it's a it's a peer to peer engagement and, and sometimes your points get discounted, but that's that's the nature of life as well, you 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 have to put up a fight sometimes to basically defend your points. Um, and, and I think it, it was what um, Priya was talking about sometimes it's about not not the other person in the room, but yourself and the voices in your head telling you that have I got a point? Is this scientific enough? Is it evidence based enough? So you've got to push against all of those demons sometimes. But it is often a, a case of putting your point forward. Um, it might be a north, northern versus a developing country perspective because some people don't even see that it's an issue. It's a non-issue to them, and you've got to you've got to push hard and fight for that. Sometimes, if you're convinced that you have the evidence, but it's all about evidence, and it's all about pushing those that evidence forward. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we are at our allotted. Um, time limit so um i'll start to to wrap up um just for people say the, the webinar is recorded so the we will be uh, sending the link and it'll be available on our website for people that weren't able to attend today um there have been some requests for the presentations to be shared so with the permission of the speakers uh, we will uh, make them available also um so that there be opportunity uh, for, for follow-up and, and further discussion. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists, um, to, uh, to Sally, to Priya, to Charmaine and to Fatima for your contributions today. I hugely enjoyed my discussions with you in the lead up to this and, and, and again today. Um, and I think there has been good interaction on the on, on the on the chat. So uh, I think I speak for all of the, the audience as well today when I think kind of the, the, the kind of the depth um, of, of discussion and reflection that you've brought today, I think is, is leaving us all with a lot to think about. Um, and it's, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, and I'm left particularly with the notions of, of dignity. Um, that this is, that this is all about bringing dignity um, and giving dignity to, to people right, uh, right across the world. Um, and also very much taking on that point of be in the room, be the person, be the voice, have the fight, if that's what is what it needs to be, what needs to be done to make to make your 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 voice heard. Um, so thank you, thank you very much today um, for your, your time today. And thank you very much to all of our audience um, for your time and participation in, in, in the discussions today. Um, before we finish up, um, I, suppose I, I would just like to kind of acknowledge and you know, spare a thought for the, the, the people of Ukraine and the people of all, all around the world who are victims 
um, of conflict uh, and war. And saying we hope for an end to the suffering and violence um, that they're all experiencing at, at this time. Um, so on that, I would like to wish everybody uh, a peaceful and a, and a very happy um, rest of International Women's Day. It's nearly over for, for some of you. So I hope you have, have a, a good rest and a, and a good night's sleep. So I'm going to say a good rest of the day to everybody else. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank